right now, I'm joined by Spencer Ackerman, senior reporter for Wired's national security blog, The Danger Room, and Tara McKelvey, a correspondent for the Newsweek, for Newsweek and The Daily Beast, and a fellow at Harvard's Shorenstein Center for the Press, Politics, and Public Policy. David Frum, author of the new ebook, Why Romney Lost and What the GOP Can Do About It, which is a hilarious title because it makes me think you started working on it five years ago. And Julian Sanchez, a research fellow at the Cato Institute and contributing editor at Reason Magazine. It's great to have you guys all here. Julian, you've been doing uh, R fantastic reporting uh, for a long time about the national security state and technology. Um, what do you make of this? And, and, and tell me a little bit about what are the conditions under which the government can read my email? Like, I think the first thought a lot of us had when we saw this was, what exactly do, does the FBI have to do to get into your email account? Yeah, uh, it's, it's actually kind of shocking. Uh, as a result of a series of weird Supreme Court decisions from the late 70s, um, the, the government actually doesn't have to meet that highest standard. There's a 1986 law called the Electronic Communications Privacy Act that governs federal access to uh, electronic communications. And while it requires a warrant for access to essentially unopened emails, uh, it permits a subpoena or a, a court order based just on a, a weak showing of relevance to be used to access uh, emails that have been opened, uh, documents that are stored in the cloud, uh, and also um, uh, emails that have sat on a server unopened for more than six months. In this case, it does look like a warrant was used to get at uh, uh, Broadwell's emails. Since she's a sensitive investigative subject, actually, it seems like probably the Attorney General should have had to personally sign off on that. I'm, I'm curious whether that was done in this case. Um, but they don't have the kinds of uh, added protections that would apply if this were a wiretap of her phone line. So, for example, um, if, it, if it were a phone wiretap, they would have had to show uh, uh, that there wasn't a less intrusive way to conduct the investigation. Um, they would have had to implement minimization procedures, meaning, uh, you know, the kind of thing where they hang up the phone if it's a mobster's wife calling her doctor as opposed to the actual target. Right. Um, and when you think about the vast amount of email uh, archives that are stored in a, a cloud service like Gmail, um, it, it it really is a little bit weird that we don't apply this because every sort of constitutional reason that you would want those added protections for this kind of secret yeah. because of the incredible volume of innocent information that's exposed would seem to apply to email, but they don't. I, I, I'm still stunned by the fact, just this basic fact, which I've learned in, 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 in reading about this and, and prepping for today's show, which is that uh, that 1986 act, the, act, the Electronic uh, Privacy, Private Communications Act, Privacy Communications Act, uh, Electronic yeah. Communications Privacy right. Act, ECPA, right. That, Emails over six months, basically the government can just go to the email provider and be like, hey, can you give me their emails? And they can say, sure. Yep. <laughs> and I mean, everyone should think about emails that are sitting on their server older than six months as basically having a big you know, sign on your house in terms of the amount of privacy that they, they confer. That's right, yeah. Uh, in, in the Sixth Circuit, there's a, a case called Warshak where um, a court did actually say that even for those older emails, uh, the Fourth Amendment applies there. Um, it's, it's amazing to me that it took as long as it did for a court to rule that the Fourth Amendment is applicable to uh, email and other kinds of digital communications like that, but uh, so you have it. And there are providers like Google that actually have been pretty aggressive about pushing back, right. uh, and, and they are able, because they've got a you know, solid legal team, to, to insist on a warrant. Um, it's not clear why a warrant would have been granted in this case once they had identified the person who sent the emails but uh, but again there you have it this is a legacy of the days before email was stored right. correct right yeah, just, yeah the, the logic behind the 1986 law is right this is written again back at a time when most people uh, are downloading email onto their actual computer right. which then becomes the physical thing that you would have to search right, right. and the theory was right email is going to be protected once you've downloaded it on your own computer by the fourth amendment and so they can assume that no one's of course going to store uh, all these emails out in the cloud because you know a mega a bite of storage space in 1986 costs $100. You, you guys, are, 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 both of you are national security reporters and you report on intelligence and stuff. And, and one of the things I think that's been interesting in the post 9 11 era is, is, is that we've seen this growth of the surveillance state and there's been amazing reporting on this. And there's been very little political pushback. I mean, it just doesn't seem like, I mean, obviously the ACLU and CCR and a lot of groups do really remarkable work in pushing against this. But in terms of a constituency for privacy, um, it's been a little hard to locate that. And I wonder if you guys think why that is and if something like this changes that dynamic. I mean, I think people are more upset about the violations of privacy than they are about a lot of the policies of the government. So I do think that's something that people get worked up about, the fact that someone can read your emails, though mine are perfectly readable and very boring, <laughs> <laughs> totally have access to them. I think there's a constituency that you can see 
pretty much across the political spectrum that is searching for a champion. Right. And there was a bit of a projection in that community in you know 2008 that it might be Barack Obama, yes. the former constitutional law professor uh, who had talked uh, in the days when he was you know coming to the Senate about the excesses of, of the the Bush era warrantless surveillance programs. Who then, when he sees he has a reasonable chance of becoming president, and there is an important Senate fight over authorizing those, somewhat legally grandfathering them back in and making them retroactively legal, right. he immediately jumps to the side of enormous expanded executive power. And we haven't seen, you know, there, there have been some people, you know, Rand Paul is a good example, um, Ron Wyden is another good example, Jason Chaffetz in the House of people who are who are recognizing that there is across the spectrum a tremendous tremendous fear about how much information the government can simply very easily and you know Already apparently does legally have, right. see yeah. Um, waiting to, you know, see someone make that a real issue, and the irony might be, you know, you get the David Petraeus Electronic Records Privacy Act well, of 2013. That's the interesting thing, and particularly for conservatives, I, I, I'm curious where the right is on this, because it seems like it would be possible to build some constituency there. David, I want to hear your thoughts on that after we take this quick break. David Frum, it's been interesting to watch conservatives respond to the, the, the Petraeus uh, news, because I think he's thought of very well among conservatives, particularly because of his role in counterinsurgency and the surge in Iraq. But then he's also working for Barack Obama, and then there's this scandal around him. And I wonder, do you think there is a constituency on the right for, for, for an actual um, pri privacy well, uh, interest? Well, I'm one of the less libertarian conservatives you're going to talk to. And I, to my mind, the really startling thing about this case is that there hasn't been enough secrecy. Um, I think it's completely understandable that uh, the FBI would want to know um, that if someone has classified documents who's also had an intimate relationship with the CIA director, they'd, you'd want to know about that. You may have a leak here. That's something to be investigated. Once you've investigated it, once you've discovered it was a purely personal matter, the question is why did it make it into the newspapers at all? And you can imagine in a different time and place the way this story would have been handled would have been the FBI would have concluded its investigation with discretion, would have shared what it knew with the president. Who would and then J. J. Edgar Hoover would have just let you know that he knows this about you but next time that you guys were the, 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 fighting some bureaucratic look, look, battle. I, I'm, I'm right now reading um, uh, Gene Edward Smith's biography of Dwight Eisenhower. Everybody knew about Eisenhower's affair. Right. Uh, Eisenhower uh, at one point talked about maybe divorcing his wife um, and he was told by the chief of staff of the army, if you do that, right. you will be fired. But if you don't divorce your wife, we will all keep this entirely quiet. The, the president could have refused David Petraeus' uh, it, um, resignation. The, when you said at the beginning of the segment, you said a very interesting thing, that we face an invasion of privacy from technology and from the surveillance state. It seems to me it's like saying New Yorkers were threatened by a giant tsunami and then by the risk of great white sharks. That one is so colossal, so gigantic a fact. Um, and we think of every... You're talking about technology being the, technology, the big one. Every terrible, humiliating invasion of privacy story you've heard. Remember that poor woman who wrote an intimate love letter to her, the man she'd met, and he then forwarded it to right. 87 yep. of his friends? Yep. Yep. Uh, that had nothing to do with the uh, That And that is, that is, I mean, I don't know where she lives now, probably New Zealand. Uh, that all of these, and, and, and in the lives of the younger people we know, the children, none of the things that ruin their lives have anything to do with government. It all has to do well, with technological possibility. Well, then what do you say to General John Allen, right? Because at a certain point in this investigative history, Allen's emails that seem to be somewhat, you know, just friendly to flirtatious from what we know from the woman who starts this investigation gets swept up in this pile. And for reasons that are really not clear to myself and some other reporters, they get sent to the Pentagon for for an, I, for an inspector general investigation because conceivably these flirtatious emails might indicate an adulterous affair which is illegal under the Uniform Code if we'd of Military never read Justice. About, if that had happened, that's a government and, and we'd never issue. read about it. If we'd never read about it, there would have been no problem. Um, that, that, that the reason that this has been so catastrophic for General Allen is because it was leaked. Uh, this is a story about leakage right, of, this, of, that's of, of investigation. No, but this, <laughs> this, it's not a so bizarre. This so was it, not initially an investigation into the leaking of classified documents right. that would be more justifiable. This was an investigation into half a dozen snarky emails. Um, and also, I mean, the, the comparison here is odd. I, I am a libertarian, um, but I think you're being too individualist about this, right? The problem in the 60s and 70s when the FBI was spying on the sexual activities of Martin Luther King and other civil rights activists, anti-war activists, members of the Supreme Court, uh, you know, uh, members of uh, uh, executive agencies, was not just that it was individually embarrassing for them and a violation of their you know, personal dignity. It's that politically, uh, in a democracy, 
democracy, the kind of power that comes with that information is dangerous beyond uh, you know, whatever indignity is visited upon the individual. But we are going to keep a very close eye on the private activities of the head director of the CIA. This is, uh, this is somebody who's got all kinds of inform valuable information. There have been security sure. problems with the CIA in the past. That is something that you, you know, counter espionage is a fact of life. Uh, but it doesn't have to appear Here, in the newspaper. Gen General Petraeus actually his email from the CIA, I would be uh, a lot less disturbed by this. General Perjay has actually had this sort of amazing thing that he said in March when he was talking about the new era of, of tech. He said, uh, I'd like to briefly discuss three major challenges of this new era, the utter transparency of the digital world. We have to rethink our notions of identity <laughs> no, and no, secrecy. None of us, and no, certainly nobody in politics, is more than 10 seconds away from a career-ending moment. I mean, Mitt Romney, think of the, 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 the two biggest stories of the Mitt Romney campaign for the presidency are all, the gifts comment, the 47 percent, all produced because somebody had a smartphone in his vicinity. And it, that will happen again and again to people in politics. But that's got nothing to do with the state. Um, I, Tara, yeah. I'm wondering what your career ending moment might be. Um, oh, <laughs> you know, I, I it's, it's, you it's a delicious buffet. Just here. Just here. Yeah, I won't tell anybody. Um, but just reminded me of what you were saying about the investigation. Yesterday I was talking to somebody from Joint Special Operations Command, and he was saying the problem was with the FBI that they investigated. And um, as soon as they saw the emails, you know, and what they said about Paula, they should have dropped the whole thing. But I personally think they should have doubled down and done, like, you know, a full course press on this there should be like a special heartbreak division at the FBI <laughs> investigating these crimes and then I think you know things would be better here you do think that yeah sure facetious. <laughs> but here's here's the other question I think now when we say well there's a, there's there's some private there's private misdeeds and I don't want to minimize this I mean I think anyone, anyone who's been in a relationship <laughs> understands the betrayal here from a personal level right so I'm not trying to minimize it but the question is like as a matter of substance and policy then the question is should what we've learned about General Petraeus cause us to rethink the Petraeus legacy and his relationship with the press we should summon him back to duty what's that we should summon we can't we have so few good generals uh, we should, he should the, I, the president should have refused his resignation the president now I mean I don't think a general can retire you remain on active duty he's a four star Spencer, call him back. Spencer a big mea culpa it. about his contribution to the quote cult of Petraeus. Tom Ricks just wrote a big uh, book, a history of generals in the post war. We're going to talk to both of them about the legacy of General Petraeus right after this.